let's just get into it. I wanted to bring to your attention, well, first I want to explain for those of you who don't know me and for those of you who might have some triggered responses here. I come out of fundamentalist Christianity. I was one of those turbo fundies, like I made it a, my job to memorize as many scriptures as I possibly could memorize so I'd have a, mem I'd have a scripture for any situation at all. I am no longer a fundamentalist Christian. In fact, I'm no longer affiliated with any organized religion. I believe that spiritual seekers at some point tend to move beyond systems of thought, philosophy, and belief, and faith, and into their own personal adventure with spirit. I think that's the way that it's supposed to be. That happened to me in my 20s, which was about, well, two years ago. <laughs> it happened to me in my 20s, which was almost 30 years ago. And... I'm glad it did. I'm glad it did. However, life is funny. You know, things that you kind of threw out, baby with the bathwater, 30 years ago, start circling back around and start making sense in a different way. And so I would consider myself actually to be an esoteric Christianity. I tend to talk in the language of Christianity, but please don't be unhinged by that. It's simply my vocabulary. It really is my language. It's the way that I relate fundamental universal principles and concepts um, for myself and to also to others. So that's who I am. I'm not a fit for everybody, but I'm going to talk a little bit right now from some scripture because I want to point something out to you that I think is so fantastic because, you know, I, what I like to talk about is our divine nature, our God nature, the God in me, the I am nature. It's really the key and I can't stress this enough, it really is the key to living the lives that we truly want to live, not just in a magical way, being psychic, being connected, channeling, seeing Metatron, but in mundane ways, in, in ways that apply to the lives that we actually lead with people in our lives and, and monies and accounts and jobs. Like Understanding our divine nature is the key to liberation in all of those things. If we don't understand who it is that we truly are, and the power intrinsic in that position, then we really can't ever become a power player in our lives. And I think a lot of people feel like they're, li they're letting their lives live them, like they just are waiting for the next thing to happen, for the other shoe to drop. They're waiting for life to just hit them again. It's this position or disposition that they've found themselves in. Well, we've got to snap you out of that because that is a life of reaction. That means you are in the matrix, my friend. You're in the illusion. You are not understanding who it is that you truly are. As a divine, God-like being, that's who you are. And, and I'd like to talk about these scriptures because I just got into kind of a back and forth a little bit on YouTube. I was talking about Jesus saying that we were all gods. You know, I love that scripture broken record and somebody challenged me on it every now and again I'll get a I'll get a Christian rolling on through who wants to take issue with me and I try to tell him look I was a turbo fundy and all that stuff is still in my consciousness and I really don't want to get into a circular argument where the only reference that you have is a book like that doesn't work for me but somebody did roll on through and question me and and so then very shortly thereafter I came across the links in these two scriptures, and I want to share them with you. The first one is, is out of uh, the Gospel of Mark, and I, this is one I've said so many times, and you've probably heard it so many times, which is, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible, and God in this case, of course, is creator. God is source energy. Creator is the one that creates and brings all things into form. And so it's through creator that all things are possible. Your dreams, your desires, your conditions, your relationships. It's through God, source energy, that these things are possible. And if you go just one chapter further, that's Mark chapter 9. Into Mark chapter 10, we see Jesus talking. You know, I like to talk to his disciples. Thick-headed disciples. He said, well, it says, the scripture says, Jesus said unto him, If you can believe... All things are possible to him who believes. Let me read that again. Jesus said unto him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. 
and the chapter right before, with God all things are possible, and to him who believes all things are possible. That means that the God in us is what allows for all things to be possible. With God all things are possible, but a man can believe and have all things be possible. Those things intersect, you see. They point to our divine nature. We are the creator of our lives. Of course, we come from the creator. We at some point have been created. Here we are in this life and we've been created. But we come from the creative impulse and we can trace our lineage, our spiritual DNA, our our genealogy all the way back to creator. That's why in this life we seek to create. We seek to have purpose. We seek to have babies. We seek to paint. We seek to connect. We're always creating something. We seek to do that because it's the creator that lives in us that makes all things possible. And so to live your life in a position where life is living you, and the bills just keep coming in and the people just keep letting you down and the job just keeps sucking and there's no way to dig yourself out. You're not understanding that you control the entire scenario. That you are a being that is having an experience in a fixed container, which is a dimension. But you as a being are outside of the container. And you've dispatched an aspect of yourself into this container to have this life. But you are not this life, this incarnation, this hair, this body, these conditions, that bank account. That's not who you are. And the sooner you get with it, my friend, the sooner you find ways in your life to align back to that which you truly are, where all things are possible through you who believes, that's when you start transforming your life. That's how things start to change. It's the law. It's the prophets. It's universal. It's unchangeable. It's how things work. And if things are messed up in your life, well, then you're not, this is not, these are not principles that you're understanding. This is not energy that you're running. I pulled out a book that I love, that I've talked to you guys about many times. This is a book called Resurrection by a gentleman named Neville Goddard. Neville Goddard, of course, thought leader, power of the positive mind. He was ever telling us about the power of our thoughts and our feelings and truly our beliefs, what we believe to be true and how we can make manifest in our material life, which he calls the objective reality, that which we can see with the senses, how we can make all of this that which we truly want it to be by simply believing. Believing, of course, being thinking and also feeling at the same time, wedding those two things together. When we think it to be true, the desire of our heart, and we feel it, we feel what it would feel like to already be that, already have that. When we walk around feeling, being in the energy of the I am, divine nature, where all things are possible, because I believe it. And through God, all things are possible. You are all gods. If you're walking around in that energy, that's how you change your objective reality. So tonight, let's go back a little bit to Neville Goddard. I'm going to read just a couple of pages to you. But these are pages filled with truth bombs. These are pages that are kind of written in an old-timey, antiquated way. But listen with your spirit here. Listen with your energy here. Neville, not unlike myself, was an esoteric Christian. He looked at Jesus not so much as a man, but as a principle of the subconscious. He had an interesting way of looking at scripture, and so he spoke out of scripture, but he was not from organized religion. He was a thought leader. This is, let me see. Actually, this is from his book, Out of This World. And this is his chapter called Assumptions Become Facts. So lean in and let's listen. Let's listen how the words of Neville verify the words of Jesus. Men believe in the reality of the external world, that which we can see outside of ourselves. Men believe in the reality of the external world because they don't know how to focus and condense their powers to penetrate 
its thin crust. Neville is saying this reality that you're finding yourself in has a thin crust, but people don't know how to focus and to use their energy in order to penetrate that easily penetrable crust. This book has only one purpose, the removing of the veil of the senses, the traveling into another world. What Neville is talking about is not intuitive senses. It's not your sixth sense. It's the sense of what you see, what you hear, what you touch, what you feel, what you taste. Neville wants to teach us not to rely upon that as reality and instead to pivot away from that in order to create a new reality within the senses. To remove the veil of the senses, we do not employ great effort. We never try hard, he's saying. The objective world vanishes when we simply turn our attention away from it. We only have to concentrate on the state desired in order to mentally see it. And also to give it reality so that it will become objective fact. We have to focus our attention upon the invisible state until it has the feeling of reality. What's your invisible state right now? Say it in the comments. Proclaim it as a man speaks, so he is. My invisible state is success. My invisible state is my new house. My invisible state is my new child that I'm calling into existence. We only have to concentrate, Neville says, on the state desired in order to mentally see it, meaning visualize it, but to give it reality so that it becomes an objective fact or it manifests. We must focus attention upon the invisible state until it has the feeling of reality. When, through concentrated attention, our desire appears to possess the distinctness and the feeling of reality, senses. Then we have given it the right to become a visible, concrete fact. Let the church say amen. Let me read that again. When, through concentrated attention, turning away from the senses and looking at the invisible, that which you would like to create, our desire appears to possess the distinctness and the feeling of reality, then we have given it the right to become a visible, concrete fact. Mark 10, 27, Jesus said unto him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Because it's difficult to control the direction of your attention while in a state akin to sleep, you may find gazing fixedly into an object very helpful. This is interesting because Neville starts talking, to what, talking about what sounds a little bit like scrying to me, which some of you New Ages out there know what scrying is. Do not look at its surface of the object, but rather look into and beyond any plain object, such as a wall, a carpet, or any other object which possesses depth. Arrange it to return as little reflection as possible. And imagine then that in this depth, you are seeing and hearing what you want to see and hear until your attention is exclusively occupied by this imagined state. What's he talking about here? Well, if we had a scrying mirror, right? If we had a dark mirror that did not give a whole bunch of reflection but had some depth, what he's saying is look into this object. Look into a wall. Alter yourself a little bit. Concentrate on this object, this whatever it is for you. And allow yourself to visualize the state that you want to manifest. Imagine then that in this depth you are seeing and hearing what you want to see and hear until your attention is exclusively occupied by that imagined state. You're immersed in it. You're running the story of it while you are practicing this meditative technique. At the end of this meditation, Neville says, when you awake from your controlled waking dream, you will feel as though you had returned from a great distance. The visible world, which you had shut out, the senses, right? Returns to consciousness and by its very presence, 
starts to inform you that you've been self-deceived, maybe, into believing that the object of your contemplation was real. In other words, as soon as you snap out of your meditation, you're going to look around and say, oh, well, that cool thing I was envisioning in the wall as I was meditating, well, it's not real because here I am back in this same situation. But, Neville says, if you know that consciousness is the one and only reality, you will remain faithful to your vision. And by this sustained mental attitude, you will confirm your gift of reality. And you'll prove that you have the power to give reality to your desires, that they may become visible, concrete facts. So he warns us. When we are in this waking dream, I like to call this the active imagination. Albert Einstein practiced this all the time. This is how he came up with the theory of relativity. He just altered himself a bit. He went into a space and he thought about it. He visualized it. He worked the problem. He imagined himself into relativity or into a new reality. What Neville is saying, don't let yourself get lost when you wake up from this dream, if you will, and be confused again by your situation. Instead, know that consciousness is the reality. Your imagination is just as real. The imaginal mind is just as real, if not more powerful, than what you can feel and touch in this 3D reality. So don't let that trip you up. If you remain faithful to your vision, and by this sustained mental attitude, you confirm your gift of reality, you'll prove that you have the power to give reality to your desires, that they may become visible, concrete facts. And so, define your ideal and concentrate your attention upon the idea of identifying yourself with your ideal. What's your ideal? I want to be a mom. I want to be a public speaker. I want to be an author. I want to be a healer. And so identify your ideal, define it, and then concentrate your attention upon the idea of identifying yourself with your ideal. Assume the feeling of being it, the feeling that would be yours were you already the embodiment of that ideal. Then live and act and do and speak and move within this conviction, because this assumption, though denied by your senses, you're not on Oprah, you don't have a best-selling book, though it is denied by your senses, if persisted in, will become fact. And Jesus said unto him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believe. They will become fact. He goes on to say, you will know when you have succeeded in fixing the desired state in your consciousness by simply looking mentally at the people that you know. Now he's going to take us through an exercise, a different kind of meditation that I work with and that's very successful. You'll know you have succeeded in fixing the desired state in your consciousness by simply looking mentally or visually thinking about people that you know. In dialogues with yourself, you are less inhibited and more sincere than in actual conversations with others. Therefore, the opportunity for self-analysis arises when you are surprised by mental conversations that you have with others. If you see them in the, in the imaginal mind, as you formerly saw them, you have not changed your concept of self. For all changes of concept of self result in a changed relationship to your world. Now let me picture this. Have you ever gotten into a conflict or an altercation with someone and, and you walked away and you said, oh, I wish I would have said that. And you start running the conversations through your mind and oh, if this had just gone that way or if I had just taken this opportunity. That's what he's talking about here. Mental conversations, thinking mentally about people in your life. He's saying when we do that, when we think and imagine conversations and interactions with the people in our life, it gives us a window into how we actually view ourselves. Are we fighting with these people? Or are we loving these people? How are these people regarding us in the imaginal mind? This is a window into whether we are changing ourselves and indeed changing our 
reality. For all changes of concept of self result in a changed relationship to your world. In your meditation, allow others to see you as they would see you were this new concept of self a concrete fact. A concrete fact. And let's say the woman who wants to be a mother, through this mental imagination, this meditation, she talks to her own mother, and in that meditation, her mother is seeing her as a mother, talking to her as a mother would speak to a mother, looking at the grandchild. In this exercise, the people that we're mentally envisioning regard us as that which we seek to be. This is, what, this is where the power is. You always seem to others, anyway, as an embodiment of the ideal you inspire. Isn't that correct? People see you according to what you believe. They do, whether you think so or not. You may think you're putting on a great face, but if you're depressed, if you're sad, if you're angry, if you feel betrayed, if you don't trust people, if you're uncertain, people see you as the ideal that you carry around about yourself. Therefore, in meditation, in this exercise, when you think about these other people, you must be seen by them mentally as you would be seen by them physically were your concept of self an objective fact. That is, in meditation, you imagine that they see you expressing, being, doing that which you desire to be. Do not underestimate the power of this mental exercise. Don't underestimate the power it has to change your objective reality, that which you see to your senses. Spending time in the imaginal mind, rewriting relationships so that you occupy the energy you're seeking to call in. If you do this consistently, this begins to show up in your actual reality. You begin to manifest it. This really works well with problem relationships. Maybe you have a family member or maybe your husband or wife or maybe one of your children or somebody you work with. Maybe you've got a problem relationship with someone. If you spend time intentionally in a meditation where you have conversations or interactions with this person and you imagine it differently, they see you as you truly are. You see them as they truly are. You spend time working this in the visualization it becomes reality. Soon you'll see these people aren't as hostile toward you. They aren't as negative toward you. The whole dynamic changes. That started in the consciousness sea. It started where things are created in the first place. Things aren't created in the 3D. First they come from the consciousness. The thinking, the feeling, and the subconscious. That's how it works. And so start to change your reality in the interior world through what you think about, through what you feel about. Start envisioning like a discipline and a practice the life that you want to live. And so it is. And Jesus said unto him, if you can believe it, all things are possible to him who believe. But what does believe mean? A lot of people believe things, right? We see Christians walking around saying, I believe in Jesus. Do they? We will know them by their fruit. We see how they truly love other people. We see how they truly act toward other people. And their life is reflected in what they believe. Belief is not head knowledge. It's not knowing scriptures like I used to do back in the day. Just a turbo Rolodex of all kinds of scriptures. I had head knowledge, but I didn't believe. I didn't walk around in the energy of that. And that's the difference. It's the occupation of the energy. And this is what I've been talking to you guys about for months now. The I am. The aligning to the divine nature. Resonating to, vibrating to right now. The reality that you are all gods. And that within you is the great I am. And connected to you is the source of all things. That you have access to these infinite resources. Do you feel that? Heart, 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 heart. Does it seem like it could be true? Because your body right now is saying, I feel that. That's your spirit speaking to you, you see. Align to that. Get into the energy of that. 
immerse yourself in that. That's how you truly believe, by occupying the energy of that. Spending time in the imaginal mind, envisioning that which you seek to create, and feeling it as if it has already been done. I'm already a success. Thank you, God in me. I'm already a mother, and I'm going to be a great mother. Thank you, God in me. I'm already a business owner. I've already healed my marriage. I've already attracted abundance. I'm already out of debt. Thank you, God in me. Feel that. Can you feel it? That's the key. Neville Goddard's most famous work to me is feeling is the secret. That's the key. You can think about it all the time if you want to. You can have your fancy vision boards. You can recite your fancy affirmations. That's in your head ball, though. What's in your body? How are you vibrating? Are you occupying it? That's where the belief is. See, so if you felt it when I said it, then you have the belief. You have the knowing, the gnosis of who it is that you truly are. Lean into that. Work with that. And soon you'll begin visualizing, meditating, and creating a reality out of the consciousness, out of that which you envisioned, bringing it into reality as a concrete fact. How many of us want to do that? I want to do that. If you assume that you are what you want to be, your desire is fulfilled. It's just a, it's just a time difference. It's just a lag a little bit in the time. If you assume that you are what you want to be, your desire is fulfilled. And in fulfillment, all longing is neutralized. Check it out. He's about to take us to church. You can't continue desiring what you've already realized. Your desire is not something you labor to fulfill. It is recognizing something that you already possess. Did you feel it? Did you, did you vibrate to it? Recognizing who it is that you truly are. It is assuming the feeling of being that which you desire to be. Believing and being are one. Let that just get into you. Believing and being are one. The conceiver and his conception are one. Therefore, that which you conceive yourself to be can never be so far off as even to be near, because even nearness implies separation. If thou canst believe, says Neville, all things are possible to him that believeth. The conceiver and his conception are one. The creator and his creation are one. The creator and you are one. I and the Father are one. Same thing, working with the same energy working with the same resources. That's the power you have access to. The mistake here is thinking you must manipulate this external reality that our senses tell us is true in order to get what you want or be who you want to be. That's not how it works. It always starts in the internal world. It always starts in who you're feeling yourself to be. You attract who you are. Like attracts like. That's how it works. And so it is. And so it is. And so for all of you who are finding yourself caught up in these deceived ideas about unworthiness, not special, not pretty, not smart, not smart, can never succeed, always passed over, never gets the job, always looking for what you can't find. That's what the senses are telling you is true. What truly is true is the energy within you that responds to the message of who it is that you are. And you see, energy recognizes energy. Energy talks to energy. And so when I say these things to you, your energy, because you are energy, responds to it. That is what is true. That is who you are. And you've just bought into a script. We all came to this particular reality to encounter the script and then to overcome the script. Oh, and then what? 
to flip the script. Now I am the master of this reality. Now we are the light workers who are ushering in a new heaven and a new earth, a new Gaia. We are the light workers who are healing the people. We are the light workers who are being the light that we seek to see in the world. We flip that script and we occupy who we truly are. That's the only way we change every, anything, anything, not just our lives, our bodies, our relationships, our money, but our governments, our countries, our families, our wars, our agriculture, our planet. That's the only way. That's the only way is when we come at it from the orientation of the I am. And so I speak that understanding into each of you, that that's who you are. Powerful light workers, get up off your knees. Powerful people, be emboldened to do what you came here to do. Thank you. Thank you for letting me share that with you.